Hello, welcome to Adopt Anklets, a place of knowledge packed and commonly tested content on the anklets. Um, if you're struggling to pass these anklets exams, then this video is for you. Um, I'll be covering the seven pillars of anklets. Um, today is the first one. Um, they will be in series um, to talk about all the key pillars that you need to know if you don't have time to study these are the videos that focus on very important topics um i'm going to give you tips and tricks to be able to answer certain key questions and this video is precise and concise we're just focusing on the key point most important things and then what is commonly tested and therefore we will continue with uh, our first um, pillar um, for the seven day challenge. So we're going to start with heart failure. So quickly, just make it easy. Um, heart failure is basically abnormal function of the heart. Okay, so you have a heart failure. It's an abnormal function of the heart. And and quickly, I will just draw a stretch for you and say, so this is the heart divided into right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. And on top of the heart, your lung sits here like that. Blood from the upper extremities go into what we call super, through the superior vena cava into the right atrium and from the inferior vena cava you go to the right atrium this deoxygenated blood there's no oxygen in it go into the right atrium right ventricle and it's make its way into the lung through the pulmonary artery and this is where oxygen is added to the blood so you have oxygen added to the blood the blood retained to the at through the left atrium, okay, through the pulmonary vein, and then it get pumped through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then later on pump into the systemic circulation through the aorta. So this is a brief analysis of what happened. Usually sometimes you can have this normal function. The heart is overwhelmed, there's too much fluid on the right side. There's too much fluid on the left side. It doesn't flow the way it's supposed to. And then it becomes what we call heart failure. So it can be on the right side. So you can have it on the right side or the left side. And therefore, we have something we call left heart failure and right heart failure. So right heart failure right heart failure, and over here, like we have left heart failure. And as you can see from the diagram, briefly, if the right side is congested, everything goes out into your body system. This blood supply, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, that carry blood from the um, your head, your neck, and the inferior vena cava, that carry blood from your lower extremities get congested, and they send blood to where it's supposed, where it was before. Therefore, based on that, you can deduce, like I say, it's pathophysiology, what kind of symptoms these patients are going to have. In right heart failure, I call it systemic, okay, systemic congestion. That is all. This is for summary for you. Systemic congestion, and what does that mean? The body system is all congested. Therefore, all the symptoms they're going to have is systemic. There's nothing in the lung. If you see an answer in the lung, don't choose it. Systemic means the body system. So blood in the superior vena cava stays there and it gets congested. It becomes what we call, they have JVD. Because the patient is now gaining fluid, he cannot get rid of his fluid. He's going to gain weight the leg is going to become edema. All the blood that the liver is supposed to retain through the inferior vena cava became congested. The spleen sent blood to the liver also get congested. So you have 
liver, spleen, congestion. And that is enlarged. You see in the answer choice, hepatomegaly, spinomegaly, that's what it means. All these things tells me the patient is fluid overloaded. Right? And if the fluid overloaded in kids, usually you see it in your eyes, periorbital edema. These are the symptoms of right heart failure. And that is what it will ask you in a subtle form. It will try to confuse you with the right heart and left heart failure. Don't get confused. This is the right side, it's the border system. If the left side is affected, you see left side receive blood from the lung. So if, get, if you have left heart failure, blood cannot be received from the lung. It will back up and it go into the lung. And therefore, patient will have pulmonary symptoms. So, so the symptoms will be all related to the lung. So don't get confused with them. Just separate them in your head. Therefore, what are the lung symptoms? Where they have dyspnea. Okay, that means difficulty breathing. They have to keep there, okay? Respiratory rate goes up. They have something we call autopnea. When they lay down, they, they, they become short of breath, so it's not good for them. They don't want to lay down. You can hear S3 sound, which is like fluid overloaded. And there's something we call PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. That means they wake up in the night and with shortness of breath, it's then a long problem. It's just the heart is full of fluid and that's P and D, okay? And the classic thing they like really much is pulmonary edema. And what, how would you see it? The, in the select, in a prioritization question, it will be, don't tell you it's pulmonary edema. It will say pink, it will be pink through the sputum. That is what it is. Pink through the sputum. That's what you mean. Or blood tanked sputum. When you see that, that's pulmonary edema, and that is a priority patient. Okay. Pulmonary edema is a priority patient as soon as possible. That means the patient is drowning in fluid and it's long, it's full of fluid, it's going to die, it's an airway issue. So you have to be sharp about it. Check my prioritization method. You have to be sharp, otherwise the patient die. So this is the everything about heart failure, signs and symptoms, which they will give you in a SATA form most of the time to confuse you or to manage it. But this is a brief summary of SATA with all the key factors you need to know the same things of heart failure and you can distinguish between them. So that's the first one. Now, when, now we know some, we know that our patient has heart failure, we get to treat it. So let's branch to pharmacology. That's why you can do body system. You do body system. Now we have a heart failure, but before we go there, if the questions are chronic, Chronic heart failure. What it means is, is the left heart failure and right heart failure. So be careful. If they tell you it's a chronic heart failure, they're referring to both sides because now the body has enough time to compensate. So they both have symptoms of the right heart failure and left heart failure. So when you look at the anxious choices, you should be seeing both. So just pay attention to that. Now, let's talk about pharmacology. Let's talk about pharmacology. So, talk about pharmacology, let's clear this. So, we already know that our patient is in heart failure. How do we treat them? The main thing is they have too much fluid in their body. So the number one thing we usually give them always, most people in heart failure, we want them to breathe faster uh, and to improve their respiratory status, to get out, out 
uh, the fluid out of their system. So the most common medication we use is furosemide. Okay, it's furosemide. But they know that you know this medication a lot, so they will give you this one. It's friend. They are the same. Umitimide. Their last name end with mite, and these are diuretics. They are stronger diuretics. So this is the stronger di diuretics like, like the other ones. So they get laces, and the laces will get rid of the fluid. There is certain side effects you have to know. You have to know no matter what. Because they're going to lose fluid, they become hypotensive. Okay? They, they lose fluid, so they become hypotensive. I don't want to go into details of the mechanism of how the fluid is lost. But in the process of losing fluid in the kidney, they tell the kidney to get rid of potassium. So decrease potassium. So decrease potassium. It causes hypokalemia. Okay, it's a sulfur, um, it's a sulfur drug. So there are certain things you have to teach the patient. They, when you go outside, they wear a long sleeve, okay? Uh, they wear a hat, they don't go under the sun. Um, so that's the common one, but they can be one symptom. So this is photosensitivity. So you teach them, we wear sunscreen, wear a hat, wear a long sleeve when you're going outside. But there's one you know, software drugs uh, problem, which you have to know really is a priority patient, is TB John uh, syndrome, where they develop small purple rash on your skin, very small purple rash on your skin. Anybody taking software drug with that sign on their body it's a priority patient. They can go into severe Stephen John syndrome, and that is really bad. So you got to tell them about that. There's one thing about laces that when you, that's, I mean, furosemide, that's another name for uh, furosemide, it's laces. Um, it's furosemide, if you usually, it, we take it by mouth, but when you're in the hospital, we give you to IV um, furosemide, okay? If you run it too fast, okay, too fast, patient will develop toxicity. So hearing problem, which is irreversible. Okay, so you gotta be, as soon as they start having um, tendonitis, you have to slow down the rate, slow down rate. It, it happened because it's going too fast. So laces can cause autotoxicity uh, IV form of laces, so you slow the rate down. That's all. You don't have to do anything. It can also uh, uh, affect the kidney, nephrotoxicity. So, nephro. So you got to be careful in the early stages when they are taking the um, furoxamine. You have to be careful with that. So these are the key side effects of them. Of course, the priority. Um, the priority signs and symptoms for this problem is going to be this hypokalemia. So anybody in taking laces, you have to worry about hypokalemia because of the cardiac effect. And then if you check my B sharp prioritization, you'll see that. If you listen to that prioritization, that is hypokalemia. Um, is number one of the symptoms we talk about. So that's the uh, everything you need to know about Lasix. Um, or furosemide. So there is another diuretics, okay, that um, hydrochlorothiazide, okay, and his friend, um, he, he, they, they, his friend, they know you know hydrochlorothiazide, so they usually give you chloro. They are almost the same, tilidone. Um, so when you see chloro tilidone, it's the same thing, hydrochlorothiazide. They also are diuretic and they make you get rid of the fluid. The best way to remember their symptoms, usually they're going to ask you signs and symptoms or side effect of this medication. I call it hyper glue. So it increases your um, glucose, 
it causes lip, hyperlipidemia. So you, your cholesterol goes up, your uracil go up high, uracil, uric acid. So you can develop gout from it. And then um, your calcium too, so hypercalcemia. It's also a sulfur drug. Most of the diuretics are sulfur drugs. So it's a sulfur drug. So you teach the same thing. Make sure you wear long sleeves when you're going out. You have sunscreen. You, you cover your head with the hat. And you, if you see a purple rash on your skin, it's a sticky joint syndrome. So we got to do everything. And they also cause this hypokalemia. So but these are the main signs and symptoms in, in terms of um, the, the magnitude of hypokalemia of hydrochlorothiazide is very low compared to um, laces, but they also do hypokalemia. So I'll just put it there. But like I said, the magnitude is very low, but it's still, you have to know, it causes hypokalemia, all the diuretics, that's that. And that is the, 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 the diuretic. The, the last diuretic I wanted to talk about is this, so these are, they get rid of potassium. There's some people we call it potassium sparing. They, are, they spare the potassium because of their mechanism. And you just have to know their name and remember, in case they, there's a teaching problem, um, you can tell the patient. This is spinolactone, it's called adductone. It binds to adosterone. Adosterone is the one that is responsible for your potassium being low in your body and your sodium being high to maintain your blood pressure. If you listen, you walk, if you read on the renin and your intestine system, so spinolactone just go and bind to adosterone. If you bind to adosterone, adosterone cannot secrete um, potassium anymore. So potassium build up and sodium cannot be absorbed. So these are potassium sparing. There's another one that they, uh, you just want to give it to you in case um, they write it, but it's the same thing. Try amitarine. It's, a, it's also potassium sparing, but I think they like spinolactone, which is very common um, potassium sparing. The only thing you need to know, they are potassium sparing, so you teach the patient, teach patient to avoid banana. So don't eat too much banana, okay? Or anything that has high potassium in it. So high potassium, diet that has high potassium. So they should avoid those things. And that is the, the, the diuretics, key side effect, key teaching moment for all of them. Okay. Then we go to the key heart failure. The treatment of heart failure is, okay, the heart is not working. So get rid of the fluid. Get fluid, take away the fluid, then remodel the heart, remodel, then improve contractility. So all the medication will be talking, they will be doing something. We talk about those that care about the fluid. Now we're going to talk about something that remodel the heart. And he, he, he helped with the function and survival of the patient. So, and that is the, the, the most important for ACE inhibitor or ARB. So, this ACE inhibitor is also related to the RENI angiotensin system. We don't need to go into details how they function, but they help with the heart, they help with the decreasing the uh, improved the remodeling of the heart, and they help with the heart failure. What it does is, it's very notorious, um, ACE inhibitor especially. ACE inhibitor, based on the name, it binds to a certain enzyme that prevent conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Therefore, you don't have adosterone being, um, being formed and doing its job. And therefore, what is going to happen, if you, you cannot make adosterone, therefore your sodium go down. So down sodium, down sodium, potassium up, because you don't have adosterone. But they also um, in prevent conversion of bradycanin to inactive form. So because they cannot do, they, they do that, 
prevent the conversion of Brady canning, canning to inactive form. Brady canning will causes bronchoconstriction. That's what causes the dry cough, dry non-productive cough. And the worst part is angioedema. So it's because angiotensin inhibitor medication block the angiotensin enzyme such that a Brady canning, that's the name, is called Brady canning. So let me just draw so that you can see what I mean. So this is Brady canning. So this has to be converted into inactive form. But this enzyme, ACE, is here. And then this ACE inhibitor come and block him. So we have more of bradycanin, and more of bradycanin will give you non-productive cough and angioedema. So that's why you have that side effect for that problem. So low potassium, low sodium, high potassium, dry cough, angioedema. Um, it's also... Um, teratogen. So you cannot use it in pregnancy, no in pregnancy. The most serious side effect of this medication is what? Angioedema. This is airway problem, airway. You got to do something about it. You got to be sharp. Airway number one. So uh, as soon as the patient is on, I am, um, ACE inhibitor tell you that their tongue is swollen. So they will, it will be slowly, their tongue is swollen. Um, they, they cannot fit the, uh, the uh, tie, their neck, um, shirt of their neck, that means the neck is swollen. Or if they start coughing non-productively, that is the early sign. The doctor needs to change this medication to another form. So this is the side effect. And you can see A, angioedema is there. C, there's a cough there. E, probably is the electrolyte. And I, um, probably the teratogenic. Uh, but this is the, um, the side effect of, and they like asking that. It's four things you need to know. Low potassium, no, low sodium, high potassium, non-productive cough, angioedema, and teratogenic. So they cause this hypotension. This is how they cause hypotension. The ARB also do the same thing, ARB, but they're very smart. They do not do, they, they skip one step and therefore they allow Brady Canning to be converted to inactive form. Therefore, they don't have no cough, no angioedema, but it also causes hyperkalemia. The same mechanism. Basically, they skip the step that caused block Brady canning to the immature because they do not have any effect on angiotensin. And that is the reason why uh, Brady canning um, ARBs can be, you know, doesn't cause cough and angioedema. So they're very, very good. If a patient is on ACE inhibitor and is coughing, you can change it to ARB. That is the answer choice I would choose. They, they to the Aptera proteins. So anybody in ACE inhibitor coughing, change it to ARB, especially if they have heart failure to help with the remodeling. Uh, ARB will do the same thing as the ACE inhibitor, except it doesn't block the, uh, the enzyme. And therefore there is no buildup of uh, bradycanin that will give, cause the cough. How do you recognize them where they have names? ARB, the way to remember them, they have something they call Satan, last name. So you have Lord Satan. And then uh, another example is Bar Satan. So the last name has Satan in it. It's not Satan, it's Satan. How about the um, ACE inhibitor? They have the prayer at the last name. So they have prayer. So uh, Lencino, Lencino prayer or capital prayer. They all have the last name like that. So you can recognize them, prayer, prayer. So these are all you need to know about ACE and their function and then side effect. That's what they're going to ask you in heart failure, in any even blood pressure, hypertension or anything like that. Okay. 
So we still on a ad failure and so and, and and pharmacology. So the Jackson, okay. This is a very important medication in ad failure. Very, very important medication in heart failure. Um, I, I, almost anybody on heart failure is on this medication. That is very dangerous. He, he has very, very uh, narrow therapeutic range, so 0.5 to 2, okay? And you have to check levels frequently to make sure you don't over, go over it. He has three functions. He has the heart pump, so it's ionotrope. Okay, it slow the rate down. So that's uh, um, chromotrope. Then they improve the speed, the time, allow the heart to relax, so bromo. So these are very important. The main side effect is they call heart block because of what they do. I don't, I, I, I don't need to explain to you how they, they act naturally because they bind to a sodium, potassium, ATPase channel, but that is too complicated. In any case, this is how they do their thing. They can be very tricky medication, they are very, very effective, and they, you see it all, more often on the floor. And so your examiners love this medication, okay? You can't take this test without a question on the Jackson. Therefore, we're going to do the side effect based on the way they act. So because they, they cause heart block, okay? They cause heart block, they slow down the heart. Anybody on it need to take their pause, apical pause, like full minute. One minute, full minute, no, 59 seconds, no. There is a range in it if you if you are adult 60, the heart rate of 60, you gotta stop less than that. If you are a child 70, you gotta hold it. And if you are a neonate 90, so hold it. So 60 for adults, child 70, less than 70, um, and neonate less than 90, you gotta hold it. So that's the number one side effect. The way I remember the Jackson is I start from the head and calm. So they start with neuro. Your head is a neuro. So they get confusion, calm down. Confusion and lethargic if they get toxicity. From your head, you see your eyes. So eye problem. And this is very common. We have like yellow, green, and arrows, vision and arrow. Okay? or you can call it scotoma, scotomas. If they see this yellow, green, vision or arrows and scotomas, they should call you the doctor, not the ophthalmology, no ophthalmology. Ophthalmology can, cannot do anything, call ACP. This is no fun, it's a sign of toxicity, okay? From your eyes, you come to your mouth, okay? Head, mouth, you, you put your head in your a hand on your head and slide it down, your nose is not involved, your mouth, or GI. This is the normal one side effect, GI, normal one, early sign. Anybody on the joxin and he has any GI symptoms, you gotta call the doctor. It's not just, so any nausea, vomit, diarrhea, abdominal pain, that is signs of toxicity. We got to do something about it. We got to be sharp. So the doctor need to be know about it. Don't take Zofrin. Don't think this is normal. Oh, I'm taking medication. Therefore, that. You shouldn't do that. And the, the, the key thing I want you to remember is any medication that we take by mouth, the early signs of toxicity is always GI, like lithium. Your body it's very, very good in telling you that something is not right through the GI tract. And so the GI tract is very sensitive and very, very smart. It can tell you whenever you start vomiting and you take any medication, it's telling you that something is wrong. So this is the number one. So as soon as you start doing that, you got to call your doctor. Early signs. So in your test, they're not going to give you um, something bad, they would just say the patient is having nausea, vomiting. They want to know if you know the critical signs 
um, problem. So now we talked about GI, you go to your kidney, it's your renal, you see, you're just going from head to toe. That's how I remember the joxin. Um, the joxin is cleared by the uh, kidney. Therefore, if you know, your kidney function is affected, you get toxicity. So uh, renal function, you want to make sure renal function is normal. And these are the key side effects of, um, and then, yeah, so the first one, cardiotoxicity, we already talked about the C before the, yeah. Um, so neuro, eyes, mouth, cardiac, and renal. So the heart block is the cardiac toxicity. So these are the key signs of uh, digoxin with early signs of GI um, function, okay? There's teaching, you got to tell them, so teaching. These are very important teaching that, so this teaching for the patient is like, they should avoid calcium channel broker. It's difficult to explain, I, it will take a long time to explain that calcium channel broker, high level of calcium causes digoxin toxicity. Just know that high level of calcium causes digoxin toxicity. And then because of the binding of the digoxin, digoxin binds specific area of the potassium ATPase pump. So low potassium, high, so watch these numbers, low potassium, high calcium, low magnesium is bad. That means if your potassium is low, your calcium is high, your magnesium is low, and you're taking the joxin, it will lead to toxicity. So you should avoid that. That doesn't mean you should increase, make your potassium uh, hyperkalemia. Just make them normal. So when you're on the joxin, make sure your potassium is normal, calcium is normal, magnesium is normal. You see, that's why you should avoid calcium channel block. Otherwise, that will increase your um calcium so don't don't let them trick you when they they say oh i will increase my potassium that means you taking more potassium no you just keeping it to the normal range we don't want it to go down that is like don't let it go down don't let calcium go high don't let magnesium go low but just keep it at the normal level then they should avoid They should avoid lycoric acid. This causes hypokalemia, like I told you, hypokalemia. So anything that will cause hypo, hypokalemia is bad. We don't want hypokalemia. And then tell them not to go and take anything over the counter if they have cold, ephedrine. This has uh, no epinephrine, epinephrine. So, yeah. Uh, Vascular constrictors that will increase your blood pressure and causes arrhythmia. And the joxin already causes arrhythmia, so you don't want that. So avoid ephedrine, avoid lycoric acid, avoid low potassium, high calcium, low magnesium, avoid calcium channel blocker. So those are the key things you teach them to avoid. There's something they, they can ask you on a, um, a kid. So kids, of course, they cannot take a big digoxin pill, so they take their pill. So this is for kids. They take oral um, solution. So the mommy, you have to give it to them, your mommy or father, you put it at the, in the side of the cheek, so side cheek or back of the throat. It tastes bad. So that's the way to get inside. Because it tastes bad, you be tempted to add it to the food because patient doesn't want it. No, no food. Don't mix it. Don't mix it with anything. The kid need just need to take it with that. No mixing with food. That's clean. Okay. Like we said in the earlier on, GI toxicity is bad. So when the kid vomit, the you gotta call the doctor. Okay. If if you give the pills to them and they vomit, you allow two times. After If they do that two times, call ACP. You need to call. 
because they've mixed two, they can mix two medication. But after two, you have to call. So when your kid is refusing to drink, refusing to take the medication, it may be that early signs of toxicity. And if they mix two, you got to call. The, the, the medication can also stain their teeth. So, so you need to brush their teeth uh, after, um, after you're giving it to them. And this is most of the teaching you need to know between kids and older patients about that. Okay, so now, more teaching. I think I remember something. For the heart failure patient, this is a SATA question you can get easily because it's a teaching education question. That is what the SATA question is about. If you have heart failure, well, what do you tell them? Wait management. If you gain more than three pounds in two days or five pounds in a week, greater than five pounds in a week, we have a problem. Call me. So that's bad. So three pounds in two days, five pounds, more than five pounds in a week. So we got to call. So call the doctor and make sure um, we are titrating your medication well. Sodium, minimize it in your diet. Minimize it. So probably like two grams, less than two grams a day, right? Less, less than two grams a day. That's good. They need to weigh themselves. So weigh yourself same time, wear the same clothes, same scale, every day, daily, so that we know if you're gaining weight, we can take care of it, okay? They should avoid NSAID. NSAID is always bad because it causes potassium retention. No, sodium, sodium retention, and sodium retention lead to fluid. So they should avoid that. Well, you cannot go outside and eat hamburgers. So avoid processed food. So any frozen food or processed food outside, avoid it. They are to improve their potassium, a sodium level to lower it. They need to undergo cardiac rehab, so some exercise monitoring, so they cannot just go and exercise. So cardiac rehabilitation to improve their heart function. And then if they are on ferrocimide, well, take some banana, right? Take banana on ferrocimide. Then if we do on spinolactone, spinolactone, I just put it like that. No banana. So you just teach them that if you're taking anything that has potassium in it and you're on uh, spinolactone, don't take it. If you're on laces, yeah, you need some potassium. So those are the teaching you provide for this patient. So that's that. I think there's one more medication, nitrate. I see them as um, they are vasodilators. And then the, what they did, they decrease your preload pre and afterload. So this basically all the fluid that is built up, this dilate the vein and increase the capacity of the vein. And they allow blood to go there and it take the pressure out of the, the heart basically. And they're very powerful medication. So think about it. I'm pulling all the blood into your vein now and taking it out, out of your heart. You can see the signs of symptoms, what is going to happen now, all your blood into your leg. If you get up all of a sudden, you become orthostatic. So orthostatic. Hypertension. So that's the side effect because all the blood is pulling in your leg again your skin will be frost, right? 
and warm. So that's the, the key side effect of them. The blood can pull in your head. That's why they get headache. These people get headache. It's normal. It's the same thing. I'm known, I'm just using the signs and symptoms and telling you what they will happen. They get headache, their leg is flushed. Um, so those are the key side effect. Um, examples are um, they have nitrate as the name. So I'll give you this one. I so sorry. As a side maybe hydralazine is one of them. Nitroprusside, nitroprusside, no, it's no one of them. So hydralazine. So these are like the very, very strong medication that can dilate and pull blood away. The one they use for heart failure is Mirilon. So this is one they use. It's very good if you have really compensated heart failure. Yeah, that can take fluid out of you. So that's the common one they use a lot, okay? Of course, you got to teach this patient. Whenever you hear nitrates, I mean, I think you, I mean, every time you hear nitrates, you should not let it go. There has to be some teaching because most older people who have heart failure, they have erectile dysfunction. So they on um, and another nitrate, okay? The fields, I call them the fields. They feel the, 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 the the penile area, basically, they feel the, uh, the spongiosum of the, the penis. That's why, that's how you can remember them. It's a feel. They feel there with blood. Uh, it's, so they didn't feel. So they are the Viagra. So the feels. So they feel it with, with blood and, and improve your erection. Well, you're pulling blood into that. And if you're taking nitrate, well, that's not, that's not good. So you tell them, don't take any nitrate. So no nitrate. If you're on any of them, that's I think the more the precaution that you have to tell them specifically. You cannot combine regular nitrate for heart failure and take one for rectal dysfunction. We got to find another one for you. Okay, so those are the um, very important, precise, and concise information. What you need to know, um, no beating about the bush. Um, like I told you, the heart failure, now we got to pump the heart. This medication, they are inotropes. You can, so you can figure out what they can do, like dopamine, you know, uh, debutamine. All they're doing is increasing the contractility of the heart. So what do you think the side effect will be? If I'm making the heart pump faster, well, uh, the heart rate goes up and the blood pressure can go up. So they become the kidney tachycardia, those are the or cardiac output improve. Those are the side effects of them. They improve. So if you give it to them, your heart rate goes up. That is acceptable. So that's um, brief pharmacology. I think we should switch um, gears. I've given you too much pharmacology, but just a summary of all the things you need to know. Now, this is what they also like to confuse you with. That's why cardiology is very, very important. Okay. So um, in, 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 if this is your heart like that, okay. You, the aorta goes down. This is the thoracic aspect of it. This is the diaphragm. It gets to your abdomen. And then it goes to your legs. All your legs. There's so many branches about it. These vessels can get into trouble. You can have plaques build up, okay? You can have plaques build up here, build up here. We eat too much and bigger, and we have plaques here everywhere. So you develop something we call peripheral artery disease. That's the PAD. Sometimes PAD includes venous disease, but I try to distinguish it a little bit. It's difficult to, I mean, and so, um, the, the easy way to think about it is artery problem and venous problem. So you develop PAD. Um, that means every vessel in your body will get the same problem and you have plaques building up. There's things that make you build plaque and slow down blood flow. If you breathe in plaque, you're clogging the tube. So blood flow doesn't go there. So they want to know if you know risk factors. Like, and that would be like a separate question, okay? Risk factors. 
Um, so what is that? How do you develop plaques in your vessels? Number one, boy, is smoking. Smoking is not good. It causes vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction of the vessel, and then that gives you um, that peripheral vascular disease. Hypertension, it makes the vessel thick. Okay, it increases your systemic vascular resistance, and then uh, also can cause decreased blood flow to your legs. Okay, um, diabetes classification and inflammation. So classification and inflammation of vessel make it thicker. Cholesterol, we know we build our plaques. So plaques. And um, when you get older, you're more likely. So like when you're over 75, you're more likely to form this problem. Okay. So these are the key that I can think of. Smoking, hypertension, diabetes, um, and then lipid and age are common things that causes peripheral vascular disease. We're talking about the artery. Okay, your artery is supplying oxygenated blood to your leg. So that your leg can get the oxygen and use it to manufacture its thing. If there's no blood going into these legs, then you can think about what the symptoms. So that's why signs and symptoms, you don't need to memorize. You can make it up as you go. That's my philosophy. So if I'm not getting blood in my leg, okay, I'm not getting blood in my leg. When we talk about the uh, nitrate, when you dilate the vein and the blood stay there, the feet is warm. So if there's no blood in the legs, in your feet, well, what do you think? Your leg is going to get cold. <laughs> it's going to be cold. So that's what is going to happen. And if less blood going there, your capillary refill, that means the, the sign of perfusion is going to be greater, okay? It's greater than two seconds. Two seconds is normal, so cap refill. Greater than two seconds, okay? There's no blood flow growing in your leg. Your skin is the most uh, very mitotic organ. That means it reproduces every three days. So if there's no getting blood supply, well, it will be shiny. Shiny skin. It can replace itself. What do you think his pulse is going to be? Weak or no pulse? Right. And if there's no blood going to the leg and there's no pulse, the toe dies. So they develop ulcer. Uh, gangrene of the, of the foot. So these are all expected findings you see. And if there's no blood going to your leg, that improves your strength and the nerves also doesn't work well, so sensation goes down. You see what I've done? That's select or apply signs and symptoms of somebody with peripheral vascular disease. Don't be surprised when you see that. And guess what? They combine it with peripheral venous disease. So what do you tell them? Based on what it, I've told you, well, we got to do certain things to improve blood flow. And number one is... Teaching, teaching, teaching. So teaching. The next, select, select or apply another one. Teaching, intervention. Walk. Walking is good because they develop something we call claudication. They walk that, and claudication, I think, is a form of demand ischemia. You're walking to, and you're exerting yourself, and the blood flow is very little, and so your muscles start cramping. It's a demand ischemia. So you tell them walk to the point that you have pain and continue to walk past it. Every time you walk past there, it get better. So walking is good. Walking is good. Then um, they need to do regular exercise. And they need to weight, lose weight. Then we got to look at these risk factors and Take care of the risk factors. Take care of the risk factors. So if you have hypertension, control your hypertension. If you have cholesterol problem, treat it. If you have diabetes, make sure diabetes is fine. If you're smoking, you know what to do. Um, and so those are the things you have to do to prevent that. 
And since they are risk of getting ulcers, you take care of their leg, wound care. Okay. Um, and there's some medication we can improve blood flow to their leg. And there's a there's an antiplatelet medication that is used. It's called pentocyphalin. That they use most of the time. And that's what they, you can also use baby aspirin is fine, but this is very good. It dilates and improves um, um, blood supply to the leg. So you tell them to do that. You can prescribe that for them. There's specific things you have to tell them. There's, listen carefully, there's blood flow to the leg is diminished. Therefore, the only way they can improve blood flow to their leg is to keep their leg down. If they elevate their leg, their pain get worse. So you tell them to keep their leg in independent position. No elevation. In your test, they will write this, dependent rubo, okay? If you see the rubo, that means blood, so blood flush with blood or pala. So they have what we call dependent rubo. So when you put your leg on the ground, more blood flow. When they elevate it, this, the skin become white pala. Therefore, they should not elevate their legs. They should always dangle it on the so that blood can flow. So if you call you and you say, hey, when I lift my leg up, my, my legs start heading, we well, dangle it all the time so that you can get blood supply and uh, help with that. So that is the um, everything you need to know about this peripheral artery disease, uh, arterial portion of it. Um, uh, and then we talk about the venous aspect of it. The venous one, this is a quick pathophysiology. Okay, so this is the leg, okay. And the vein, vein as valves, okay. These are the veins. So the veins as valves. And it allow blood to flow in one direction. So when the blood is in your leg, it should go up like that. But the vein can become incompetent. They start refluxing blood down. So you have more blood sitting here. That's all, that is the pathophysiology of this disease. The, the, the blood, it, it doesn't go up into the heart anymore. It just refluxing down. The valve doesn't work anymore, incompetent valve. And the blood stay in the leg. So all the symptoms is based on blood pooling. Therefore, we're going to use that to find signs and symptoms and risk factors, so risk factors. Anything that will keep blood pooling in your leg is a problem. So what? Prolong standing. I know some of the nurses to stand for a long time. Sometimes you can get that. So prolong standing. Um, or if you have varicose vein, the, so tortuous vein is because of the reflux. And so blood stay in the vein and that can give you uh, venous disease. Aura contraception. Okay, it's not good. It causes DVT and I will make the vein incompetent. And pregnancy is the most thrombogenic. That's the key word, thrombogenic. That means they, they make clot in that state when you're pregnant. And that can also cause the venous disease of your leg. We already know blood is pooling in the leg. So what do you think? Um, the symptoms is consistent with blood pooling. If blood stay in the leg, for a long time, like we did with the nitrate, it's going to get warm. So their leg is warm, okay? Very warm leg. And what is in the blood? It's pigmented, it's brown. So when the blood stay in the, there for a long time, it diffuses and you have blood sediment uh, on their skin. So they get brown pigmentation. You see their feet is like brown pigmentation. Um, and then because of the fluids that the blood is bringing in, the, the leg is really thick, unlike the arterial one is skinny and shiny. So these people, they have um, thick, thick skin, okay? They have very thick skin. 
Um, and this is the, the common, and they develop it to develop ulcer because the blood stay there and causes the problem. So you can use this and that, and you'll be able to answer any question of this because they will try and mix them together uh, and then don't let them fool you, okay? Um, the, the ulcer is in the middle, middle portion of the, the ankle, okay? Unlike the arterial one, the ulcer is at the toe, the toes. This one doesn't have toe ulcers. They have on uh, above the ankle. So it's the medial aspect of it. So that's where they have the ulcers. What do you tell these people teaching? Well, avoid prolonged standing. If you can't avoid it, then wear some stockings, okay? When you wear the stockings, before you get out of bed. So you tell them if you have stockings, put it on while you're on bed. Then when you get up, it's already on. Because if you get up, blood already pulled into your leg. They cannot retain anymore. So putting the stockings on will not do anything anymore. And like the opposite, like there's a video I did, bi-directional thinking. We did, um, you know, the, the arterial people, peripheral arterial disease, dependent robo is very good for them. If they dangle their feet, it's better. If they elevate it, it's good, bad. Therefore, the opposite is that these people, if they stand on their feet, it's bad. So they should elevate, elevate your foot. Elevate foot. It's better for you. And this help blood return to the heart. So that's why this is very, teaching is very important for them. So this is all you need to know. Nothing else for PAD and P, uh, PVD. So this, everybody dread this, but I'm going to make it easy, sim simple, straightforward. Okay, we have a heart, okay. And we already I've shown you the the uh, the lung is here. He has branches. There's separation. There's right atrium here, right ventricle here, left atrium, left ventricle. In congenital eye disease, so the flow of blood is affected. Usually, blood comes from here, go here into the lung, come here and go into the aorta back. Well, guess what? This is affected. So there is spaces, I call them. So you have spaces between communication between these people, the ventricles. The ventricle can communicate. The atrium can communicate. There may be blockage of this going into the lung. There may be no return. The, these two vessels can communicate. That's all. That's all you need to know. The what the test is going to ask you is whether the shunt, we call them shunt. These communications are shunt. Is the shunt from right to left or left, um, right to left or left to right? And what are the symptoms? That's all. Don't bother yourself. Know their names and then which direction they're moving and then which way to uh, take care of the patient and what you see. So, um, you can see that if blood is moving back from, from, let me draw it. If blood is moving from the, from the left to right, now you have more blood going to the right. The blood go into the lung. It become pulmonary congestion symptoms. I'm trying to simplify it. Left to right symptoms will be pulmonary because you're pushing all the blood from the left to the right again, and it's taking it to the lung again. So they're going to have pulmonary congestion. So this is pulmonary congestion. Right to left, you're, you're skipping the lung. So there is not going to be any um, pulmonary congestion. So minimum, minimum pulmonary congestion. And this is how you can find the symptoms. You can make the symptoms easy for you. So examples of left to right, okay, from the left to the right is there's a way you can recognize them. 
okay there's a way you can you can recognize them easily okay and they are ventricular septal defect okay left to right you have atrial septal defect and a and a pda pectus ductus arteriosus because they're moving from left to right these are the spaces alone so this is patent ductus arteriosus this is the atrial septal defect this is the um, ventricular septal defect you can see that the blood is moving from the left side the left side is always oxygenated blood so if i'm moving my oxygenated blood to my right side patient is not going to be so they are is cyanotic okay so they don't have any blueness i call them so they're not going to be blue they can they are acyanotic and they confuse you they put that as a choice but you have to just identify that is the left to right so these people are acyanotic okay and the rest of it is story all you, you're going to see is long symptoms all you're going to see is long symptoms so the blood stay in the heart because it's moving from the left to right. They have CHF. So they have C CHF, okay? And you can hear murmurs from them, okay? And then the respiratory rate can go up. The heart rate can go up. And because they, they are congested, they don't gain weight. And their metabolic rate will be high. So poor weight gain. And the key thing happening is when you're feeding them. When you're feeding a kid, feeding for kids is an exercise. And when you exercise, what do you release? Epinephrine. If you release epinephrine, what happens to your heart rate? It goes up. It makes you sweaty. So feeding, let me say it again. So feeding, feeding, so feeding is an exercise for them, exercise. So when you're exercising, you relieve epinephrine, no epinephrine, and you become tachycardic, diaphoretic. This is what happened to this patient. When, because they have to exert themselves to feed, when you feed them, they will have diaphoresis. So no, kind of, no cyanotic diaphoresis with feeding. You got to know the key difference. Diaphoresis with feeding, they didn't become cyanotic because they are not cyanotic, okay? So diaphoresis with feeding. So they have ADA cyanotic, they have CHF, they have a mama, heart rate goes up, poor weight gain, and they are di they, when you feed them, they become diaphoretic. They may probably ask you about patent ductus arteriosus, he has um, loud machinery mama. They like that. ASD, I think, is a split S2. So this is a split S2. So split S2 is ASD. PDA is um, holosystolic mama. So loud machinery mama, in case you see it's an answer choice. So that's all you need to know. This is all you need to know. Uh, VSD, ASD, these people are acyanotic. So they don't, they are not blue at birth. So you have time to take care of the uh, problem and fix, fix it later. You don't need to fix it right away. You can fix it later. But these are the uh, symptoms that is in poor weight gain, diaphoretic with feeding and the acyanotic. That one, I want you to know that. Acyanotic with feeding, they have poor weight gain, and diaphoretic with feeding. Now, uh, let's look at the other guys. They are notorious, so they're bad. And so the way to recognize them is the T's. I call them the T3, the T T's. They all have the T as their first name. So the trilogy of following. So that's the first one. I know everybody knows that one. Okay, the second one trans transverse arteriosis. You don't need to worry about them. Just remember that there's a T. Okay, we start with the T. Trans transverse arteriosis. 
Then we have transposition of great vessel. There's another one I don't need to mention, anomaly of the great vessel. We just have a video on detail about them if you want to listen to them. Basically, these people are moving the blood from the right side to the left side. It has not gone into the heart and to the lung. So there's no oxygen with it. Because there is no oxygen, these people are cyanotic at birth. Okay, they are cyanotic at, at birth. Okay, so you have to pay attention um, when they give you those questions. They cyanotic at birth, so you got to be like really, really, and because of the cyanotic, the hypoxic. Okay, and if you are hypoxic, the number one sign of hypoxia is clubbing of the of your feet. Okay, or your hands. That is number one. So cyanotic, hypoxic, and therefore they have clubbing of the hand and the feet. And then when they're crying or they're feeding, is they they too they have to exert themselves. So crying, feeding, what happened? They become cyanotic. Unlike the um the other guy, um the the left to right, they have diaphoresis. They become diaphoretic. These people are usually cyanotic. Those are the key four difference you have to know in a certain question to be able to distinguish them. Right to left, right to left, and bypassing the lung. Blood is not going to the lung, and therefore, um, what is going to happen? There's less um oxygen in the blood, so you are cyanotic. You are hypoxic. You have clubbing of the feet, and then when you're crying or feeding. Yeah, cyanotic. So those are the features you have to know. They want you to know something specific about this disease, the trilogy of pull. That's what they like. There's three portion of it. We have pulmonary stenosis because of that. So here is blood. So that make it the right heart, right heart failure. If the heart, right heart failure happen. Blood need to move away from the heart. So there's a hole here. They took the hole, ventricular septal defect, and then they override the aorta. So it makes sense, okay? Stenosis, no blood go to the lung. Blood pull up in the right ventricle. Right ventricle said, I need to push this blood out. The ventricle said, well, we'll open up for you. So they have ventricular septal defect, and then the ventricle push the blood out of the aorta. So that's what they have. They have the same symptoms, so but this is what they have. And in your, if you see something about tet spell, basically they're talking about this. The patient is crying or feeding, they have cyanotic. All you need to do is swaddle the kid. If he's a young, but if he's older, you can tell them to squat, okay? Or knee to chest. And that would decrease the shunting. Knee to chest, squat, and swaddling uh, would decrease the shunting, and that will improve their oxygenation. So those are the um, key features. Remember, I told you these people are really, really hypoxic. So don't be surprised if they give you in a question, hypoxia will lead to high red blood cell. They will make a lot of blood, red blood cell to compensate so that it can absorb the little oxygen they have. If you have a high red blood cell, your hematocrit can go up to like 50. And what does that mean? Polycythemia vera. And how do you treat it? Phlebotomy. That means they have blood draw. It can cause headache and stroke. So it's not a freebie. So hypoxia lead to, uh, you, Red, increased red blood cell will lead to hematocrit to be high, develop polycythemia. The treatment is phlebotomy, but your symptoms, you get headache, you can get stroke. So these patients, you have to monitor them carefully. So that's all, congenital heart disease. Okay, now 
my favorite aneurysm. So I told you about the heart. Okay. Now he's sending his blood out. Sometimes the vessels get bulges out. You have sac like projection. And this go. So this is in the chest. And this is the abdomen. This is called thoracic abdominal aneurysm. A thoracic aortic aneurysm. This is called abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's all. They are aneurysm. Aneurysm means bulging of the vessel. And when blood get here, there's turbulent flow. It goes here, it goes here, it goes here. It come, then it goes here, it goes here, it goes here. So because of that, you can hear a brewery, like bee buzzing sound, like a bee. Um, and there is too much pressure on the wall. So the problem with aneurysm is rapture. And that's all you need to know. And then let's go to things that they will ask you. For thoracic aortic aneurysm is in the chest. If this big goomba is in your chest, it's pushing on everything in your chest, you have shortness of breath. Or um, dysphagia, okay? Uh, dysphagia, that's the most common because the chest is really protected. This is the most common symptoms. But the bad symptoms is when they rapture. Okay, so if they're going to give you a question, it may be somebody who is rapture. And it may be, uh, who do you see first? So thoracic aortic aneurysm. Rapture. You have to know how they present. That's key. Sudden. Onset, tearing, chest pain, radiating to the back, upper back, okay? So sudden onset, tearing, chest pain. It's, a, it's not just a chest pain, it's tearing. Something is ripping, radiating to the back. Those are the symptoms. And there's a reason why it present like that, because of where it ripped. Usually it happened with deceleration injury. You are in the car, you had an accident, you slump on the, in, uh, the, the, the brake, your chest hit the, the screen, um, the steering wheel, and the hiota basically tear away the aneurysm. So you have sudden onset chest pain radiating to the back. It's tearing. Treatment. Slow down the heart. Slow heart down. That's number one. So what do you give them? Beta blocker. And you have to, I know they will be hypertensive, but you want them to have what we call permissive hypotension. So the systolic doesn't need to be 150, 160. Systolic blood pressure 100 is perfect for them. With a heart rate of 70, you're saving their life. They will need surgery, but this is number one. So in the question form, don't choose surgery because if they make it to the hospital, they will leave. If they don't make it, most people don't make it. So if they make it, they will leave. So slow down the heart, beta blocker, and then blood pressure of 100 is good for somebody who has tearing chest pain. That is what you want them to be. And that is the thoracic aneurysm. To repair this, they go into your chest. And so you're going to have incision in your chest. And after they repair it, they will have chest tube. So just know the difference. Chest tube in the chest and the incision go into the chest. So that's that. Then we have the Abdominal aneurysm. That one is notorious. Um, you is where it's located is in your abdomen, so we can feel it easily. So we can is easy is easy to feel it. So it come like that, and you go into your legs, so we can feel it easily. And this is your belly button, okay? So you can feel a mass. You see a porcita. Um, let me see. So you have a positive mass 
at the um you see a mass uh, on the left so uh, on on the right left of the umbilicus okay left of the umbilicus you can you can feel the mass there or you can hear a brewery that tells you there's an aneurysm there if the size is greater than five yeah repair it with surgery or endovascular so most of the time they are asymptomatic if they have symptoms, they need surgery. That means they're about to rupture. But you can feel a palpable mass in the abdomen. When they give you that, that is a priority patient. You hear a brewery in the somebody in the abdomen, you're not supposed to hear it. It's a priority patient. If it's greater than five centimeters, it's a priority patient. You got to repair it. Okay. So how would these guys present? The same thing. Sudden onset of abdominal abdominal pain radiating to the back okay and they will have either a brewery okay or you can hear what's called pulsata or satin mass in the mid abdomen so that is not good Okay, so those are the signs. If they give you this sudden onset of abdominal pain radiating to the back, a brewery or pulsating mass radiating to the back, that's a palpable, that's an aortic aneurysm that is ruptured. This patient needs surgery. The same thing, these people, you resuscitate them, but you keep the abrupt pressure like in 100 range and get them ready and for surgery. So you got to control them. You got to take care of them. There's two ways of doing this. There can be endovascular. That means they go through the groin or they go into the abdomen. So uh, that's open repair. Open repair, they have incision and they put the graft in it. That's all, that's all you need to do. They have incision in their abdomen. And the vascular repair, they go through the groin and they put a stent in it. So there's no incision. They go through the groin and, and, and poke the femoral vessel, they find the injury, they put a stent in and they repair it. That's all that you need to know. I'm not going to bore you with information. What they're going to ask you it's what you do. So one has incision, the other one doesn't have incision. The other one, you go to the groin, and now um, they both have stent and graft. It's the same thing. But then, what do you do post op? So post op is the same post op. You got to check for bleeding as number one. Bleeding, number one symptoms. They're not going to tell you that the patient is bleeding, but they will give you a heart rate that is low. No, heart rate that is high, blood pressure that is low, urine output that is low, change in mental status, or new onset back pain, that is still evidence of bleeding. So you have to check for bleeding. So new onset of back pain, low urine output, high heart rate, low blood pressure, acute change in mental status, that tells you they're bleeding. So bleeding, bleeding, bleeding is number one. The key, key thing about this endovascular is the groin. You check the groin, the groin is very important. And that's where you will know that it's bleeding. You will see a hematoma in the groin and you put your finger just two centimeters above where the, the, the incision was before, where they did a percutaneous incision in the groin to put pressure, so direct pressure on the vessel is the treatment of choice for hematoma uh, when a patient and when endovascular repair of the aorta. So that's the treatment for that. Um, and so you have to know that. The key, what they're going to ask you is some of the things that you do for endovascular, okay? It's the same thing as somebody having cardiac catheterization. This is the same thing 
is catheterization. So if somebody and I go cardiac catheterization, the same thing you do. You got to check if they have contrast allergy, so iodine allergy. You got to make sure they don't have, because of the contrast, you get them to do the study. Shellfish is normal. So it's okay to have shellfish allergy. Don't um, cancel the procedure. So shellfish is okay. You got to check if they have diabetes, metformin. If they have diabetes and they take metformin, they need to be off 48 hours. But if you need emergency surgery, fine. But you don't start it for another 48 hours too. So that's the Otherwise, they develop something we call lactic acidosis. And post-op, these are patients, they, you have to be with them for a long time. You have to check their groin that they are not bleeding, otherwise they will bleed. So you check their um, groin the first hour, 15 minutes times four. So Q 15 minutes times four. Then the second hour, Q 30 minutes times two. Then Q one hour um, for the next four hours times four. So a total of six hours. You have to know this. So check if, if they are allergic to iodine. Anybody who's having vascular repair, either endovascular or heart catheterization is the same thing. Somebody coming with a heart attack and is you need cardiac, cardiac catheterization, you can use the same information. Check the uh, iodine allergy. Shellfish is not a problem. If they have diabetes, metformin, 48 hours before, 48 hours after, in order to prevent lactic acidosis. And then the post-op, this is your treatment. And check the groin if you see any bleeding, direct pressure. And this is all you need to know for uh, these two problems. Once again, the evidence of bleeding after the surgery is they have groin hematoma, they have new onset back pain, signs of bleed, hypotension, so tachycardia, hypotension, and they will have bruises in their belly button called, bruise in their belly button called curling sign, and it, at the fr front area is gray tenor, okay, and they have in their side, in their flank area, great tenor sign. That is retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So that's your sign of hemorrhage. So we finish with the aneurysm. Well, I think more fun, then we'll be done. It's this guy, statins, they're very important. Okay, they involve with cholesterol. Um, they help with the breakdown of um, cholesterol in our system. There is enzyme that is responsible for that. So out of statin and all these statin medications, they help with the cholesterol. This enzyme, HMG, HMG CoA inhibitor. And I, I wrote it down so that you, you should know the enzyme because that's the side effect right away. What it does is they increase your HDL to up to 50. You want it to be greater than 50. They lower the LDL. You want it to be less than 100. Triglyceride, they lower it. less than 150 and total cholesterol less than 200 so this is what it does and you can see they had up i mean 50 um 100 150 and 200 but just remember everything goes down except hdl hdl is a good and therefore, if it's high, it's good. Low is bad. So if your HDL is 5 or 20 or 30, it's not good. We want it to be greater than 45. And this is what it does. It improves this level and improve your cholesterol. They will ask you about side effects because it's very important. So 
I told you HMG CoA inhibitor. That's how they lower the cholesterol. So what is the side effect? H is liver. So hepatotoxicity. So it causes liver injury. So you got to avoid other medication precaution for liver injury. Okay. Cause muscle pain. This is not good. You got to call. Warning sign. G is GI symptoms. They, they are bloating. So GI bloating. And glucose. Your glucose is high. And the C is related to the muscle pain. Muscle pain is because muscle is breaking down and you have something we call creatinine kinase. That is a protein made by the muscle. And so this goes up. And when it's greater than 5,000, this is called rhabdomyolysis. So I'll talk about it later. Greater than 5,000 is not good. Labdo manage. That's, that means the muscle is dying. They also have the C, also have what we call cataract. So, cataract. Then A is, to, is teratogenic, so avoid in pregnancy. And the R is the rhabdo I told you about. Basically, the muscle has broken down, release the CK, um, creatinine kinase, it build up, it form clog into the blood vessel, it go into the kidney and clog the kidney. And then, so rhabdo, what you see is, you see a dark urine, some weakness. You see some weakness, um, which they don't like. Uh, urine output will go down because of renal failure and potassium K up because of the breakdown of the of the muscle. So muscle breakdown from the the starting. There's a mechanism. You don't we don't need to talk about it. But you break down the muscle, you start having muscle pain, your CK goes up greater than five thousand, that means too much muscle breakdown. You get to the kidney and block the kidney. You have dark urine, weakness um urine apple will go down and the potassium go up and it become problem that is a priority patient rhabdomyolysis is a priority patient you need to see and the eye the last one is i is increased glucose again so hmg coa that's how you can remember all the side effects of starting in a very quick time without any problem. So what teaching we want to tell them, if you have muscle pain, call me. Please call me. Okay, if you have muscle pain, call me. Okay, you need to check the LFTs, the liver function test because of the liver toxicity. And this medic, you make cholesterol mostly at night. Okay, you make cholesterol mostly at night. Therefore, take this medication, take it, at night, don't take it in the morning. So you take your cholesterol medication at night because that's where you make a lot of cholesterol and this will prevent production of cholesterol. And then you check the uh, liver function and then if they have muscle pain, call you before they develop rhabdomyolysis. And that is all. Remember, rhabdomyolysis doesn't have to be muscle uh, starting. It can happen even with cocaine. Somebody taking cocaine or yeah, um, somebody go out and run for a long time, the muscle will break down. Cocaine causes ischemia, and it can lead to that. Or you have trauma, you have severe muscle breakdown. So don't get fooled if they trick you. They say somebody have cocaine, the CK is 5,000. Yes, that is rhabdo. Okay, when the CK is greater than 5,000, that's your diagnosis right there. So that's one. Then another farm, amiodron, that's my favorite. 
So this is a medication is antiarrhythmia that we you use it to in your ACLS protocol multiple times. You use for tachyarrhythmias uh, to take care of it. Um, it's very important medication. Somebody in court, and you have to know something about it. We don't have to go into detail. The main thing is the side effect. Okay, the side effect of amiodarone, and I have something for you. I uh, call it P clone. Okay. We just want to know the side effects. So the the um the P is normal one. So this is normal one side effect. This is pulmonary fibrosis. So they form scar tissue in the lung. And they are they are lung function decreases. So to know you can do pulmonary function tests. Okay. And the C is the cardiac, okay? They have cardiac toxicity also. So they destroy the heart, okay? And the L is the liver, liver toxicity. Almost every salient organ is in trouble. And the O is optic. Your eyes also is in trouble, optic neuropathy. They have a video on this already. And the N is Neurological, they get confused. The E is endocrine, okay? So their TSH goes up or TSH go down. You see this, so there's a LFTs, so this is LFTs, liver function test. You have a TSH and a FM, pulmonary function test. And the last one, they have skin rash, dermatitis. And this is classic dermatitis. It's usually, um, it's a blue, green coloration of the skin. And this is all you need to know. Number one, you have to know this. If they give you all these side effects, choose pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary anary fibrosis. Why? Even though they have cardiac toxicity, this is airway. If your lung doesn't work, well, your heart is dead. You can, heart can be not working, but you can breathe. You can help yourself. We can support you. So lung, that's why pulmonary fibrosis, I would choose if it's a priority patient and he develop non-productive cough. Any patient on amiodarone with non-productive cough for several months, that is a sign of pulmonary fibrosis. You need a F and PFT to check and make sure the lung is not too fibrous and restricted. And so that's a priority. Why do I call it P clone? If I, 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 I call it, if you take Amodium, we're going to clone you because of your pulmonary fibrosis. So um, Amiodaron, you develop pulmonary fibrosis and we clone you, you're dead. So anybody with cold, Cough on amiodarone has developed pulmonary fibrosis is irreversible, and we're going to clone you. You'll be dead soon. So this is um. So I have some miscellaneous. This is a quick one. I'm not going to waste too much. You guys already know. We talk about angina. All it means is ischemia. That means there's less blood flow to your heart. It's like less blood flow to your le legs that we have the claudication, the same thing. Demand ischemia. So we have something we call stable one, angina, and unstable. The difference between them is stable is this is predictable. I know that this is going to happen. So if you're working, like somebody who have claudication, he walks because he's exerting themselves, they'll get pain. Stable angina, you walk, you, you exert yourself, you lift it, some, something, you run it, or you're doing something, you're mowing your lung, you have pain at your chest, yeah, that is stable angina. Unstable, I don't know when it's going to occur, so it's unpredictable. So they'll be sitting down, they'll have pain at rest, or they're walking, then they have pain, and then that means they have, they're getting to the point where they have MI. 
MI means basically the clot has blocked total blood flow loss to the heart, such that one portion of the heart is now ischemic, is dead, the tissue is dead. And that is a heart attack. And that presents with chest pain on the left side, radiating to the left arm, to the jaw. Diaphoresis, okay, and nausea. There's some people who doesn't present like that, like di diabetes patient. They have peripheral neuropathy, so they may not have chest pain going to the left of the, uh, the extremities. No, they will have like nausea, vomit, and heartburn, but there will be diaphoretic sweating. That's a sign of heart attack. The treatment is morphine, oxygen, nitrogen, and aspirin. But it's written like that. I think normal one is oxygen, so it's O-man. So you give them oxygen, morphine to decrease the anxiety, aspirin, and the nitro. So that's the treatment for that. If you get the EKG, you see ST elevation or Q waves. But the main treatment is this. So then there's this something we call pericarditis. Basically the heart, covering is either inflamed by some tissue or something is on top of it, it um, the scar tissue, it can be some inflammation, it can be viral, it can be bacterial infection. And then the pericardium, that's the tissue that surrounds the heart is thicker than normal. And so this patient, they have, and uh, when they breathe, they have, Friction rub, so pain, it's called pericardial friction rub. You can hear a crackle pain um, and inspirational pain, basically. And then the pain get better when they lean forward. Okay, that's your uh, buzzwords. And then when you get an EKG, there's something we call diffused ST elevation. A diffuse ST elevation at all leads. That is your diagnosis of pericarditis. So they have chest pain, um, friction rod pain, and then when they lean forward, the pain get better. You get an EKG. There's a diffuse ST elevation. That is pericarditis. So this is um everything. Um, I've tried to cover as much as possible in a very short time. I don't know what time is it, but that is very uh, uh, comprehensive. There's few things you have to add it to, maybe tamponade, other trauma-related emergency prioritization questions. Um, but this is a comprehensive cardiology. Um, thank you for listening. And take care of yourself. Visit my channel and subscribe for more content. Good luck with your studying. All the best of luck.